Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our final lesson, lesson 10, where we're going to begin by reviewing the properties of exponents from our previous lesson. And then from there, we're going to add a few more properties of exponents. And then we're going to begin to talk about some exponential functions. So let's just a quick review. At the end of the lesson yesterday, we were introducing some of the uh, additional properties of exponents. Like, what do you get when you have a zero exponent? We discovered that we always get one. And if we have a negative exponent, that it ends up just being, take the base number and move it to the bottom and make the exponent positive. So x to the negative 3, for example, is 1 over x cubed. And 4 to the negative 2 would be 1 over 4 squared. And 8 to the 0, because any number to the 0 is 1, except for 0, of course, um, that's going to end up being 1. So today, some new ones. And we're going to do some experimenting with our calculator. So the first thing I'm going to ask you to do is grab your calculator, and I want you to type in each of the numbers in this top row. So I want you to type in 4 to the 1 half, 25 to the 1 half, 49 to the 1 half. So um, for those of you that are working with a TI-83 calculator, you are going to type this in like so. You're going to go 4, hit the caret button, and then you're going to need parentheses. So parentheses, 1 divided by 2, close parentheses, and hit enter. If you don't do it that way, it's going to take 4 to the first power and then divide that result by 2, which is not what we want. So go ahead and type those in and let's see what you get. Go ahead and do that now. All right, so hopefully you've done that typing now. And you've got numbers like 2 and 5 and 7. And our job today, of course, it's really always what our job is when we're doing math, is to know what the uh, pattern is. So when you do a 1 half power, what appears to happen? So when, a, when you do a 1 half power of 4, you get 2. And 1 half power of 25, you get 5. And a 1 half power of 49, you get 7. Seems like those are always the same thing as the square root. And it is. So a to the 1 half power is just another way of saying square root of a. All right, so what about a 1 third power? Let's try those. If you haven't already done so, hit the pause button and type those in. Go ahead and do that now. All right, hope you typed them in. Uh, 27 to the 1 third power ends up to be 3. 64 to the 1 third power ends up to be 4. And negative 125 to the 1 third power ends up to be negative 5. Now you might be thinking, well, if 1 half power means square root, then 1 third power probably means cubed root. And that would be true if, for example, 27 to the 1 third is 3. If 3 times 3 times 3 is 27, is it? Well, 3 times 3 is 9 times 3 is, yeah, that's right, 27. 64 to the 1 third, 4 times 4 times 4. Is that 64? You betcha it is. And negative 5 times negative 5 times negative 5 is negative 125. So if you were thinking cube root, you were so right. And this is how we write it. So we write like a square root, but we were to put a little cube in there, a little 3 in that little crook there. That's called the index. The 4, the 8 to the 1 fourth power, by the way, that ends up being the fourth root of a. And then generically, we'll say that a to the 1 over n is the nth root of a. So now I'm going to ask you to simplify some without using a calculator. You can always use a calculator to check your answer. But let's show that we understand what it means to say 100 to the 1 half power. So 100 to the 1 half power is the same thing as saying the square root of 100. And that, of course, is 10. Negative 8 to the 1 third power is the same thing as saying the cube root of negative 8. Now, some people get a little confused by that, as they might have up here as well, because we know we can't take square roots of negative numbers, but we can definitely do cube roots of negative numbers, because a negative times a negative times a negative is a negative, so it does work out. And in this particular case, the cube root of negative 8, even if you don't know that, you could probably guess. So because it's an even number, it's probably 2, and you might try, well, negative 2 times negative 2, that's positive 4 times negative 2, that is negative 8. So in effect, the answer is negative 2. 81 to the 1 fourth power is the fourth root of 81. And again, you could probably figure it out by just kind of guessing. Um, it's not going to be a 2 because 2 times 2 is 4, times 2 is 8, times 2 is 16. That's not 81. In fact, 81 is not even an even number, so that's kind of silly to even try. You might try 3. See if you can do that in your head. 3 times 3 is 9, times 3 is 27. Is it possible that 27 times 3 is 81? Oh, it is absolutely possible. In fact, it is. So the answer is, in fact, 3.
Now, when you look at the next three examples, uh, you're going to see that we have fractions for the exponents for sure. The bottom of the fraction is always going to tell us what kind of a root it is, but the top is actually going to represent a power. So when I look at these next couple of questions, like 8 to the 2 thirds, for example, here's what I'm thinking. It is that 3 is going to indicate an index of a root. So it is the cube root of 8. But the 2 is going to represent a power. So we're going to square it when we're done. So cube root of 8, well, that is 2. Wow, hold on a second. I just made a big smudge there. So cube root of 8 is 2. And then we have that second power, which means our final answer is 4. Take a second, guys, and check that one on your calculator. So go to your calculator and type 8 to the 2 thirds and see if you get 4. Go ahead and do that. I should hear clicking buttons right now. No, I, of course I can't hear you, but you know that's what I want you to do. All right, next one. Uh, four to the five halves power. Well, the two in the bottom indicates a root. So that is a square root. And we don't always write it, but you can if you want to. You can just say that's a square root of four, and then the five is a power. So what's the square root of four? Well, we all know it's two. And then there's a power of five, so it's two to the fifth power. Can you do that in your head? Use your fingers, I am. 2 times 2 is 4, times 2 is 8, times 2 is 16, times 2 is 32. I used all five of my fingers to get an answer of 32. Now, I don't know if you all can hear this, but I got a little puppy dog sitting next to me, and she's being a little snarky right now, so I kind of have a feeling that I'm going to be taking her for a walk in just a second. Let's finish this one up first, though. So for this next one, 16 to the 3 fourths, um, why don't you write down what you think it's going to be, and let's see if we agree. 16 to the 3 fourths. Can you hear her being snarky? All right, that is, let's see if you wrote this. I wrote four root of 16, and that whole thing is going to get raised to the third power. So what's the fourth root of 16? Well, it's an even number, so it's probably a two or a four or something like that. I'll start with a two. Two times two is four, times two is eight, times two is 16. So this is, in fact, two. Two to the third power is eight so our answer is eight and of course you can check any of those you want on a calculator all right let's move on to our next uh, page all right in our next page we're going to begin to talk about what it means to be an exponential function and we're going to do that by thinking about three different problems in context what their graphs look like and what their equations look like so we're going to do that um, in just a second i actually am going to hit the pause button and take my dog for a quick walk because i think she needs to go use the bathroom and i'll be back in a moment so continuing on, we're going to look at a couple of different situations and see if we can't, as I mentioned, um, make a table, make a graph, and then talk about what the equation would look like. Now this first one's a little awkward. If I were in class with you right now, you'd be watching me do this. Uh, we'd be doing it together, but today we're just going to have to imagine. So say I have an 8.5 by 11 piece of paper. So I'm going to draw it. So this is my paper. How many congruent rectangles do you see? And there's just one, right? Well, it's not great, but it's one rectangle. So if you don't fold the paper at all, in other words, you have zero folds, then you're going to see just one rectangle. But if you fold it in half so that there's a crease that goes right through here, then how many congruent rectangles will you see? One and two. I see two. So one fold would create two congruent rectangles. Now say we're going to fold it again. So this will be a second fold. So we're going to refold it on this dotted line and then fold it again on this dotted line. How many congruent rectangles do you see now? I see two folds would give us four congruent rectangles. One, two, three, and four. All right, now I'm going to fold it again. So I'm going to fold it on the original one, which remember was this one. And then I'm going to fold it again on this one. And then I would fold it again. And what that's going to do is it's going to create two creases. One of those creases is going to be right here. And the other one is going to be right here. So that was one, two. This is a third fold, but it created two creases because it was folded. So three folds gave us, as you can count, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight congruent rectangles. Can you predict what it would be if I had four folds? I'll bet you could, looking at the pattern. Do you see a pattern here? It is a multiplication pattern. You'll see that it's a times two pattern, which means this would be 16. If you thought 16, you would be correct. So in thinking about what this graph would look like, here's what I know. That with zero folds, there's one rectangle. So that's zero, one. 
at two folds, excuse me, at one folds, there's two rectangles, so that's one, two. At two folds, there's four, so I'm gonna go all the way up here to four, that's like right here. At three, there would be eight, that's a little harder to get, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, that's gonna be like right about here. And at 4 would be 16, which would be way up here. And what you're going to see is that this graph has a bend in it, and it kind of looks like this. And you might say, oh, Mrs. Campbell, I think it's a parabola. It kind of looks like that, but it's not, guys. Um, the other half of the graph, which doesn't make sense in the context of this problem, but it looks like this. So next up is the equation. Now, it's a y equals equation. Our job is to figure out what that equation is. You told me, or you thought about, I hope anyway, that this was a pattern of multiplying. In fact, it's repeated multiplication. This is 2 to the first power. To get to the next one, we multiply by 2 again. That makes it 2 times 2, or 2 to the second power. When we get to this one, you multiply it by 2 again, so you ended up with 4 times 2, which is 2 to the second power times 2, or 2 to the third power. And of course, you probably can see that pattern. This is 2 to the fourth power. So what's the pattern? It is 2 to the x power. And that's what an exponential equation looks like. So that's what this graph represents. So now we're going to modify that situation a little bit. And this time we're going to look at bacteria. So instead of folding paper, I want you to imagine a bacteria. And do you know what a bacteria looks like? I mean, it's super tiny, but it kind of looks like a bean. And so what happens over time is this beam, in this case, is going to double every hour. In one hour, that bean, bacterium, is going to split into two bacterium. That's how it grows. And then, so this is hour zero, you know, and this is hour one. And then another hour later, each of those is going to split into two And we would have four. Now you're hopefully seeing the same pattern that we saw up there with the one, the two, and the four, and so on. But here's the difference. In hour zero, we're going to start with 50. So one hour later, when it doubles, each of those 50 is going to become two bacterium. And so each of those becomes two, and we end up with how many? You got it, 100. And then... After another hour goes by, each of those becomes um, another 2, so that 100 will become 200. And then another hour goes by, and each of those 200 becomes 400, and so on. Now, hopefully what you're recognizing the pattern is the pattern is really the same kind of pattern. It is a doubling pattern. It's a multiplication by 2. It's a multiplication by two, and so its pattern or its equation is gonna look very similar to the other one, and so is the graph. Here's where the difference lies. The graph is going to start at 50. So it's gonna start right here. And if I count by 50s, that's 50, 100, 150, I'll count this as 200. And then this would be 300, and up here would be 400, and so on. Okay, so I'm consistent with my counting. So it's going to start at 50. After an hour, it's 100. After two hours, it's 200. After three hours, it's 400. And you can see that same kind of bend in the graph. And so the equation is certainly going to be related to the equation that we had up top. But here's the difference. It doesn't start at 1. It starts at 50. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write down the numbers from the previous one. So remember the 2 to the x ones from the previous one? They're very similar, right? This one was 1. This was 2. This was 4. And this was 8. And so what I want to think about is what would you do to a 1 to make it a 50? What would you do to a 2 to make it a 100? You got a number in your head yet? What might you do to a 4 to get to a 200? What might you do to an 8 to get to a 400? If you are thinking, take each of these numbers and multiply them by 50. 50 times 1 is 50. 50 times 2 is 100. 50 times 4 is 200. And 50 times 8 is 400. And you would be right. So how does that change my equation? Y equals 2 to the x. It becomes y equals 50 times 2 to the x. All right, now we're going to change the situation one more time. So this time we're going to consider the NCAA tournament. Does that make you sad when I say that? 
because of course you know the NCAA tournament did not happen this year, uh, so neither did a lot of things. Let me tell you, I had tickets to go to a Bucks game the weekend that the season got canceled. I had tickets to go see the Brewers play the Cubs on Memorial Day weekend, and that got canceled, so it's all super sad. And of course, all the baseball in the area got canceled, softball, it's all very sad. Very sad for people like me who like to watch sports. So. Let's pretend it's a normal year, and let's think about how the NCAA tournament works. So the NCAA tournament starts with, hold on just a second, starts with, at stage zero, 64 teams. So 64 teams enter the tournament. All right, and then what happens is they play a game. So at stage one, a game is played. Every one of the teams plays a game. Half of those teams are winners, and half of them are losers. Now the NCAA tournament is a single elimination, meaning you lose and you're done. So half the teams win, half the teams lose. The losers go home. The winners, there are 32 of them, they move forward and they play another game, game two. Each of those 32 teams are going to play a game. Half of them are going to win and half of them are gonna lose and the losers are gonna go home. So all that will be left are the 16 winners those are called the Sweet 16. And then we get into Game 3. In Game 3, we have um, another game played. 16 teams are playing a game. Half of them win, half of them lose. We remain with the Elite 8. And then a fourth game is played. Half of those 8 teams lose. They go home. We are left with the Final 4. And then our another game is played in the final four. Then we're left with just two teams. And then the championship game is played. We're left with just one. These guys are the winners of the tournament. It's a big deal, guys, a big deal. And we're super sad that we missed it this year. So let's just compare. Comparing this to the situation we have, because we're going to write an equation, although I don't leave myself space for that. We are going to write an equation here. So I want you to compare the equation we had up top to the ones that we have here. Now the other ones in our table had patterns of multiplication by two. What's this one doing? Did you say dividing by two? If you did, you are correct, but there's another way of saying divide by two. You can also say multiply by one half, and that's how we're gonna say it. We're always gonna describe our patterns as multiplication patterns. So since the other ones were two to the x, this one is gonna be one half to the x. The first one started at one. So if I go back to my first one up here, it started at one. Oh, I can't see that. Somehow I lost my pen here. All right, I'm gonna hit the pause button for a second. No, I'm not. All right, something's going on with my computer and I'm afraid it's because I'm my battery is low. I'm gonna try plugging in and see what happens. And I'm not sure you can even hear me, but the clock is still running. So here it goes, I'm gonna plug this in. Let's see if that helps. All right, does it? No, I still have no pen. I cannot change anything. I don't know what's going on here. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and stop and see if I can figure out what's going on. I'd like to stop. I can't do that either. Oh, you know what? I'll bet my pen's dead. Hold on just a second. I'm going to see if it's my pen. All right, guys, that was weird. That's never happened to me before, but now I figured it out. I use an Apple pen to do my writing, and the Apple pen has to be charged, and I didn't charge it, so it died. Um, so I don't remember even where we were at, but I think we were writing the equation, um, and we talked about the fact that it's a multiplication by a half versus a multiplication of two. And I think I started to talk about how in the first equation, it started at one, and there is an invisible little one right here in front of the two to the x, that's its starting value. The second one started at 50, so I put a 50 here. And the third one starts at 64, so I'm gonna squeeze in, I wish there's a little more room here. Let's see if I can do this with a little more room. I'm gonna move that equals, ooh. Can't erase, apparently. All right, I guess I'm gonna squeeze in. Ugh. This is getting to be a frustrating lesson between the dog and my apple pen and all of that. So it's gonna be a 64. So just to make that look a little nicer, it was 64 times one half 
to the x power. Now, what does the graph look like? Well, this one's going to start way high at 64. So I think what I'm going to do here is maybe count by fives on the graph. So five, this would be 10, 15, 20. This is 30, 40, 50. Up here would be about 60 and so on. Okay, so the graph is going to start at 64. That's about right here. And then 32, that's going to be about right here. And then at 16, at 2, it's going to be about right here. At 3, it's going to be 8. That's going to be a little bit shy of 10. At, at uh, 4, it's 4. That's going to be about right here and so on. And so what's going to happen is the graph is going to do something like this. Now you'll see that this graph looks quite different than the other ones. The other ones were increasing. This one is not, it's decreasing. You can see that in the table. You can see it in the graph and you can also see it with that multiplier being less than one. So let's summarize what equations look like and let's see if we can finish this lesson off without any more problems. On the third page, on page three here, it says, generally speaking, exponential functions are of the form y equals a times b to the x power, where a is the starting value and b is what we're going to refer to as the multiplier. Sometimes the graph looks like this. We call that exponential growth. And the rectangle question and the bacteria question, those are both um, exponential growth. The other times it's going to look like this. And that's what we call exponential decay. So when is it growth versus decay? Decay, by the way, the situation was with the tournament, the basketball tournament. Um, it's growth whenever the multiplier, which is b, is bigger than 1. Making it bigger than 1 is going to make each successive term be bigger than the other one by whatever that multiplier is. It will be exponential decay whenever the b value is between 0 and 1. In other words, some fractional value, which will make it smaller and smaller. b, incidentally, can never be negative. b also cannot equal 0. So those are kind of some restrictions. A is where it starts, so it's also the y-intercept, so that's going to be our A value. And so what I'm going to ask you to do in the next four questions is sketch it. So when I sketch it for these next four questions, first thing I'm going to say is where does it start? And then I'm going to say is it growth or decay? So for the first one, where does it start? Well, it starts at 25, so I'm going to put 25 on my y-axis. That's going to be my start. This is just going to be a rough sketch here. And then the multiplier is 3. 3 is going to make it bigger, so it's going to represent growth. And the graph is going to look like this. This, by the way, is called a horizontal asymptote. It never reaches it, and it never crosses it. So it never crosses the x-axis. Example 2 starts at 10, so I'm going to label the 10. 3 fourths is less than 1. That means it's going to be exponential decay, and it's going to look like this. And again, it will never hit the x-axis. It will never touch the x-axis or cross it. All right, now I'm going to hit the pause button. And I'd like you to try C and D on your own. Please do that now. All right, let's see how you did. First one's a little tricky because there's no number there. So really, this is y equals 1 times 1 1.08 to the x. It's 1. It's the starting value. Did you pick up on that? That was the tricky part. 1.08 is bigger than 1, so it's going to be exponential growth. And then the next one's going to start at 23. And 0.6 is less than 1, so it's going to be exponential decay. All right, moving on now to the next set of problems. In this next set, we're asked to write an equation, and to do that, we're going to have to know two things. Where does it start, and what's the multiplier? And sometimes, guys, it's kind of obvious. Sometimes it's not. This first one, I think, is kind of obvious. So if this is a multiplying pattern, what do you multiply 5 by to get 20? You know, I think it's a times 4. 20 to get 80, also times 4. 80 to get 320, times 4. That's the multiplier. Where does it start? It starts at 5 because that's what's across from 0. So the equation is y equals starts at 5, multiplies by 4 to the x power. There's my equation. Done. Now, if it's not obvious, I thought it was kind of obvious here, but here's what you can do. You can always take the second number and divide it by the first number. So if you take 20 and divide it by 5, compare that to the next one, which is 80, divided by 20, Compare that to the next one, 320, divided by 80, and what you're going to see 
is that all of those reduce to four. And that's how you can find the multiplier when it's not obvious. You just have to look at the dividing. Since you're trying to figure out what the multiplier is, you divide to find out. So let's pretend that we need to do that in our next example. So you might look at that and go, well, it's obviously I divide by three. Well, maybe it isn't obvious to you. And so maybe you'd go, well, I'm not really sure what it is. So I'm gonna take the second number, I'll switch color here so we don't confuse our work. I'll take the second number, which is 400, and divide it by 1200. And I'm gonna compare that to 133.3 repeating, divided by 400, and so on. And now I'd pick up my calculator and actually type that in. So I'd go 400 divided by 1200, and when you do, you're gonna see 0.3 repeating. If you wanna convert that to a fraction, then that's gonna, you hit the math button to do that, and it's the first option, so math, option one, that's going to show you one third. That's what the multiplier is. So in this particular example, this one starts at 1200 and has a multiplier of one third to the x power. And that's our equation. Now our final example, guys, is a little bit tricky. And the reason it's a little bit tricky is because the first couple numbers aren't there. So I'm gonna to have to find what that number is across from the zero. And to do that, I'm gonna start with this. I gotta figure out the multiplier. So what are we multiplying by? That's what I'm asking. So B, I know it's gonna be 6.25 divided by 12.5. Right? I am pretty sure my calculator is now far away from me, so um, I'm pretty sure it's a half. Um, I do want to be doubly sure though. So if I take half of 12.5, do I get 6.25? I think I do. So B is a half. And now that's what the multiplier is. So if I want to work backwards, then instead of multiplying by half, I would divide by a half. And what's the same thing as saying divide by a half is to say multiply by two. So if I go backwards through the table, 12 and a half times two is 25. And 25 times two is 50. So let's see if our pattern works. If the multiplier is a half, start with 50. Half of 50 is 25. Half of that is 12 and a half. Half of that is 6.25. Good to go, here it is. Y equals, starts at 50, multiplies by a half to the X power. All right, let's see if we can finish up before my battery dies again. Here goes, last page. Last page of the summer. All right, so this one has, uh, says to write an equation of an exponential, write each with an exponential equation. Y is going to equal A times B to the X. B is the multiplier, A is the start. So here's one that refers to the population of Eau Claire. The population of Eau Claire is increasing about 3% every year. It was 65,000 people in the year 2005. So what I'm gonna say is, Let's let 2005 be our starting value. So we're going to say starting year is 2005. And so my equation then is going to be starts at 65,000 and it's growing by 3%. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the population and you might say we'll just multiply it by 0 0.03. So this is 0 0.03. But because we're talking about growth, we gotta take that 0 0.03 and we have to add it, 0 0.03 times the 65,000, we have to add it to the 65,000. In other words, we have to keep 100% of the population and then add another 3% of the population, which is 103% of what we had. That's the same thing as 1.03. So when we have growth, we use one plus the rate. That's what our multiplier is going to be. 1 plus 0 0.03 to the x power. Or you might say 65,000 times 1.03 to the x power. So what if it's not? What if it's decaying? So in the second example here, Sam ingests 600 milligrams of ibuprofen. She thinks it decays 15% every hour, which means that in your bloodstream, it dilutes as fluids are added to it. It dilutes at 15% per hour. So in this case, this is not going to be growth. It's going to be decay. So the multiplier here isn't going to be 1 plus the rate. The multiplier is going to be 1 minus the rate. In other words, it's going to subtract off 15%, that's what this R is gonna be, 
from the 100% that you have to begin with. So it's going to subtract off that 15% and that's going to leave us with 85%. So 85% of the medication will remain every hour. So my equation would go, starts at 600, the multiplier is 0.85 to the x power. All right, so this is what we have when we have decay. Now let's read our final example. The final example says, a hot air balloon's height in meters can be modeled by the equation y equals 4,000 times 0.45 to the x for x in minutes. Write sentences that explain the meaning of a and b values in that equation. Be sure to use the numbers in context of the problem. So in other words, you don't want to say, it starts at 4,000. You want to tell me what it is. So what is it? It is the height. So why is measuring the height? So I'm going to say the height starts at 4,000. That's my starting value. And height is measured in meters. So I'm going to say meters. That's what this says. That's part one. Next question is about the 0.45. Now notice that 0.45 is a number that's less than 1, which means it's decay. So the 1 minus r is 0.45. We have to figure out what r is. So I'm going to subtract 1 from both sides. That would give me negative r is 0.45 minus 1 is negative 0.55. Divide both sides by negative 1. And r is 0.55. Five. Now, another way of saying that, guys, is we are keeping 45% of the height every minute, which means we are losing 55% of the height per minute. And that's what I'm going to write over here. So I'm going to say that the height is decreasing at 55% per, and this is important, minute. It's a rate of decrease. It's decreasing 55% per minute, or you could say it's keeping 45% of its height each minute. All right, so those are two sentences. Now, there's a whole lot more to exponential functions than what we did in these last couple of days, but this is a nice, good, solid basis for when you enter pre-calc in the fall. Um, you should be familiar with those, and we'll continue that thought as the semester begins. So go ahead and get to the homework, and remember that you also have to do a... Um, post test for me this in this time period so please make sure you do that and get those uploaded all right we'll see you in the fall guys